gonna tell it. I believe it. Talk about me. If you please, the more you talk, I'll be in my knees. Talk about me. If you please, the more you talk, I'll be in my knees. Come on, Alto. God said it. I believe it. God said it. I believe it. Tanner, God said it. I believe it. How many of you believe that the Lord will make a way out of no way? Go sell it. And I believe it. Say that you go. I'll go with you. Open up your mouth. And I'll give you the word to say. If you go, I'll go with you. Open your mouth. I'll speak for you. Talk about me. If you please, the more you talk, I'll be in my knees. Talk about me. If you please, the more you talk, I'll be in my knees. I'm gonna wave my hands and pray. I'm gonna give God the praise. I'm gonna shout the victory. I'm gonna wave my troubles, all my troubles away. God, God said it. And I believe it. God said it. And I believe it. God said it. If he said it. If he said it. You better believe it. Oh, take him. Come on, come on, praise the Lord. He's not a man that he should lie. If he said it, he's able to do just what he say he gonna do. Yeah, 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 we thank God, we praise him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God, it shall stand forever. Amen. God has made great and precious promises to us. And I don't know about you, but I believe every promise of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Believe just what he said. Giving honor to God, our pastor, Dr. Scott. I am so very humbled and grateful for this opportunity, sir, that he had the confidence to ask me to come at this time. I I'm grateful for the presence of Miss Scott. Her loving and motherly demeanor means a lot to me. I thank God to all of the fine officers, um, visitors, friends. I see my mother-in-law, I have to say that, and my lovely wife to my left. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Other family and friends I won't acknowledge at this time. There is a word from the Lord. And... Uh, I just want to get on with that particular assignment. Now, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It is good to be here. Amen. Amen. It is good to be here. God, by the silent movement of time, has allowed us to come to this 11 o'clock worship hour, spared our golden moments to run on and roll on just a little while longer. And I don't know about you, but I've got to give him some praise while I have a chance. Amen, amen, amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we love you. We thank you. Mm. There's a sweet spirit in this place, and we know it's your presence, Lord. Now that we are in your presence, we want to sit at your feet and learn of you. Thank you that you said your burden is light and your yoke is easy, that we can take it upon us and learn of you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that although we've come here from different directions, with different situations, circumstances, we've come, Father, out of our common need to hear from you. It's a crazy world we're living in, Lord. We need to hear a word from you. 
Some have to go back tomorrow into a world that's prone to beat them and bruise them. We need to hear words from you, Lord. Father, I pray by the movement of thy Holy Spirit and the manifestation of your power that the people will be blessed by thee and never impressed by me. Let the people hear you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my rock and redeemer. And the people of God said, Amen. Help me in just a verse of my prayer hymn. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No. I'd like to go on with that, but I'm going to stop and talk with you briefly. Our text for this morning's message can be found in the Divine Library. Of course, you know there are 66 books with two major divisions, Old and New Testament. Our text can be found in the New Testament portion of your Bible. Amen. Turn to what is commonly called the Book of Mark. It should be called the Gospel according to St. Mark. Amen. In this fifth chapter, and I thank Master Jalen Williams for reading it into our hearing. Amen. God bless you, sir. Mark 5. Notice with me, our text was read from verses 38 to 42. But we're going to get there and do something just a little different. I'd like to speak a word for the Lord from the thought, your condition is not your conclusion. Your condition is not your conclusion. Have you ever heard someone ask or say, rather make the statement, don't let a mountain, or rather don't make a mountain out of a molehill? Have you ever heard anyone say that? The cautionary statement means to not that we shouldn't let little problems become big stumbling blocks. Amen? Amen? When that happens, brothers and sisters, or rather, this is what happens when things are blown out of proportion, such as when people bend the rules, stretch the truth, uh, have double standards, and are unfair in their dealings with others. Things snowball and get out of control, way out of hand, if not nipped in the bud. They are blown out of proportion, and that's what happened in Jenner, Louisiana. I'm sure that everyone here is aware of the fact that for the past two weeks, the national media spotlight has been shining bright on this now infamous city, Jenner, Louisiana as six black teenagers found themselves on the center stage of an unfolding drama. What began as a little series of inappropriate actions and hateful overreactions continued to escalate and snowball until they grew into a big mess, which once again exposed to everyone that the systemic problems, racial prejudice, and double standards existed there 
deeply rooted and have caused great suffering and deplorable living conditions for minorities there. However, on last week, something happened which set off another series of turning events in that case. Thousands from across the nation, hoping to prevent a greater miscarriage of justice, convened there, rallied in support of justice, and marched in protest against the unfair conditions. Finally, three days ago, the last child arrested in the case was released from jail. Fortunately, due to the level of public outrage and opposition, they were forced, the, the powers that be were forced to change their position. And now Michael Bell has, been, has a different condition and is moving toward a better conclusion. At the press conference, a man said something that arrested me. He said that it was the divine intervention of Jesus Christ that caused the change in the conditions. And another man, to our chagrin, said that he was offended and appalled that this change that occurred was attributed to the divine intervention of Jesus Christ. Lord have mercy. Some of you here may be like him. Perhaps you can find or see some help or hope somewhere else, but I can't point you to anyone but Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I can't point you to anywhere but to Calvary. Amen. Brothers and sisters, just as God worked in the midst of that situation and circumstance to bring about a change so that the boys in the, rather the unfair uh, judicial personnel's intended conditions on this boy would not reach their intended conclusion. You need to know that God does move and act in this world. I know so much is going on, and it's easy for us to feel uh, abandoned, but there's no need to feel hopeless, brothers and sisters, when God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. No need of feeling hopeless, giving in to despair, being despondent, when God is available to help us. The two statements made at the press conference were a result, or rather based on a belief system. One is based on the premise that God does not intervene in the affairs of man, and the other one is in contrast a conviction and a firm belief and affirmation that God does participate in our daily lives. Amen? I don't know about you, but it helps me, and the Bible substantiates for me that God cares about what I'm going through. The Bible says in Psalm 138, Though the Lord be high, yet he have respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. The psalmist went on to say, when I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou wilt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of my enemies. Thy right hand shall save me. That sounds like God does get involved, doesn't it? And I think that's good news. It's not just good news, it's wonderful news. It's mind-renewing news. It's heart-comforting news that our condition doesn't have to be our conclusion because God is standing by to help us. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now, I want to say this. Before we go to our immediate text, I'd like us to go back to the beginning of this fifth chapter and get the entire contextual continuity. In other words, to see how it all fits together. Because in this fifth chapter of Mark's record of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, there's proof of the Lord's ability to master all situations, change any condition, and determine the conclusion. For example, in verses 1 through 20, Jesus heals a man who was a demonized lunatic. <laughs> and thus proved the Lord's ability to master demons and change mental conditions. In verses 25 through 35, the Lord heals a woman with a prolonged issue of blood. 
providing evidence of his power to change physical conditions. Now that brings us to our text, where Jesus is going to deal with the other serious conditions involving terminal illness and the death of a little child. In this account of the encounter between Jesus, Jairus, and the conditions affecting the 12-year-old man's 12-year-old daughter, we will learn some important lessons and see that Jesus can change conditions and determine conclusions. Last Sunday, our pastor, Dr. Scott, preached from the subject, Haters, Spectators, and Participators. <laughs> well, you know, I thought about that in the light of this recent case and in this text. Mr. Francis Bacon, the old English philosopher and scientist, once said that in this world, only God and angels are spectators. He was a wise man, but he was utterly mistaken. Not so, Mr. Bacon. Our God is no spectator. He participates in the affairs of man. He does not just stand idly by and watch us, his beloved children, suffer pain. No, no. The Apostle Paul wrote it this way. He said, we have a high priest in Jesus who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. God is not aloof. God is not indifferent, noisy, apathetic concerning what we're going through. Amen? Yeah, he does participate. Lord have mercy. And Paul went on further to say, after you have suffered a little while, he wanted to encourage the church. God will himself come and strengthen and establish you. And in Mark, Chapter 5, we see Jesus demonstrating God's compassion, love, and willingness to rescue us. Amen. When we can't rescue ourselves and no man can rescue us. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, have you ever stopped to think about what it would be like in this world had it not been for Jesus? If Jesus had not come in to be our friend, did you ever consider how helpless and paralyzed our homes and churches would be if it were not for Jesus? Did you ever consider how challenging and uh, defeating our circumstances would be to us were it not for divine assistance? Maybe you can't imagine what it would be like, so I'll just try to describe it briefly for you. Without Jesus, there would be no mercy, no grace, no salvation. Without Jesus, there would be sin without forgiveness, failure without hope, bondage without freedom. Without Jesus, there would be sorrow without joy, grief without comfort, hate without love, burdens without relief, and without Jesus. Our conditions would be our conclusions. No one can care for us like Jesus. No one can give to us like Jesus. No one can love us like Jesus. The truth is, Dr. Scott, no one can understand us like Jesus. No one can protect us and provide for us like Jesus. In this text, we see that Jesus and his disciples were traveling by boat back and forth. Notice Mark chapter 5, verse 21. They were traveling by boat across Lake Galilee. Since Jesus had by this time moved his ministry headquarters to the centralized location of the city nearby named Capernaum. He was probably, it was probably part of his evangelistic strategy to sail into and out of each of the ten nearby seaports in what is called the Decapolis to do ministry. As soon as they got, in, got out of the boat and crossed the sea, a large crowd of people were there to meet them. That is Jesus and his disciples. One of the persons in the crowd waiting to see Jesus, anxious and desperate, was a man named Jairus, the synagogue ruler. He was in desperate need of help for his child. 
Jairus was an administrator at the synagogue. He knew all the rabbis, pastor. He knew the priests and the power brokers, amen, in the temple. But when tragedy struck, he thought about Jesus Christ. You know, you can be extraordinarily religious and not know Jesus. You, you, you do know everybody in church hadn't been born again. Everybody in here hadn't met the living Lord. Everybody in synagogue hadn't been converted. But I, I saw some things in here, Pastor, that impressed me. This Jairus was closely associated with the church, the place of worship, yet he knew who Jesus was. A whole lot of people come down the aisle, pastor, and join the church and never join Jesus. But Jairus was a synagogue administrator, but he knew Jesus. <laughs> that leads us to our first lesson that leaps from the text. If your condition is not going to be your conclusion, you need to go to the right place for help. Jairus found the correct source. He didn't turn to the priest or rabbis when he had an emergency, when he had a family challenge, a personal issue, when he had demanding conditions and life-threatening situations. Jairus went to Jesus. Lord have mercy. You know that old country music song about looking for love in all the wrong places and looking for it in all the wrong places. Faces, but I'm afraid that people go to the wrong folks sometimes looking for help. You can't find any assistance going to people just as messed up as you are. You can't get any help going to people just as afraid as you are. You, you remember when Peter was walking out on the water and began to get in trouble. Peter began to sink. He was going down. He lost his focus. And Peter didn't look back in the boat, Pastor, and ask help from any of those fellas. How are you going to get help on the water from people still in the boat? <laughs> Peter said, Lord, save me. So that's the first lesson here. You, you, you need to learn from J. Iris to go to the right source. Yeah, the next thing I want to call your attention to in this text is that although he was a ruler, that's Jairus, he, he, he assumed a posture of humility. As soon as he saw Jesus, the man dropped to the ground, fell to his knees, and bent over prostrate, bowing his head to Jesus' feet. Lord have mercy. Well, why you mentioned that, Reverend? I'm so glad you asked. Too often we allow our pedigree, degree, and position to keep us from getting a change in our condition. See, when you think you're so such a much, you, you remember that? God gives grace to the humble. Grandmother used to say, only the humble gonna taste the grace. See, what you need, God has it. And if you're going to get it, you've got to get it God's way. You've got to humble yourself and come as a little child. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he took a humble posture, fell at Jesus' feet. Yeah, you remember 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. God said, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their lands. I don't know about you, but I think the land needs healing. And we ought to pray. Lord have mercy. Let me rush on. Let me rush. Let me rush. Lord have mercy. If, if, your condition isn't going to be your conclusion. You need to be willing to humble yourself. I, I think you get the point. The third thing that impressed me uh, is this successful father didn't send his wife. I see a lot of children in here, and I see a lot of mothers. I 
often tell people that our women need us and the children need us. That, that's men. And they need us to have some money and some power and a connection with God. I studied, I studied J. Iris, Dr. Scott, and I, I like this man. I'm impressed with him. He was successful. He had position and status and notoriety. He had power and influence. Uh, let me pause and say this parenthetically. I didn't intend to say it, but since the Holy Ghost is leading me this way, you know so many times men mistakenly believe that success outside of the home compensates for failure therein. This man took some time to plead the case of his child. It's in the text, isn't it, Pastor? It's, it's there. All right, let me, let me rush on. J. Iris goes to Jesus. He falls on his knees. He starts crying and asking for help. Begging for divine assistance. Help not for himself. Help not to climb higher on the socioeconomic ladder of success. He said, Lord, deliver my child. My, 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 my. And I want to say this too to the young people. You need to know, I know you like to go around talking about uh, what I do is my business. And I, I was uh, reprimanding some young boys in a restaurant one day, about five of them. And the boy said, you ain't none of my dad. I said, boy, what that mean? Tell me I'm not your daddy, please. Anyway, I want you to know, young people, what you do affects others. If it didn't, if, if, if your life and your actions didn't affect others, why did thousands go to Jenna, Louisiana? So if you want people to stay out of your business, you may be robbing yourself of needed help. I'm glad thousands of people got into the boy's business or he would be locked up this morning. Can I get a witness here? So don't go around telling adults that you ought to learn to respect that they have no right to say anything to you because what I do is just me and don't, you know it doesn't affect anybody else no what you do young people affects others it, it affects the classroom it, it affects the school it, it affects the community it affects the church and you know when you go out in public and behave poorly you embarrass your family. When you go to school and act like a fool, you hurt the heart of your parents. You, what was happening with this child made J. Iris suffer pain. You don't know. You don't know the night's parents lay in bed crying out to God for you, trying to make ends meet. Robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, oh, I'm skipping a light bill to get you some shoes. You don't understand the level of sacrifice. And you have no right to embarrass your family. You have no right to dishonor your mother. You have no right to disrespect your father. No, 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 no. You don't have that right. I, I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> yes, he pleads on behalf of his child. And I want to encourage some parent here this morning who may have a wayward child. Don't you give up pleading the case. Stay with it a little while longer. You can't hurry God. No, you just have to wait. <laughs> but he'll be there, don't you worry. J. Iris met Jesus because he showed up. And if he showed up then, he'll show up now. Dotted people said it a long time ago. He's an on time God. Jesus steps in just when we need him most. Hallelujah to Jesus. So the compassionate Lord Jesus agreed to help him. And they began walking to Jairus' home. But suddenly, 
they were interrupted on their way. And that brings me to my next point. Jesus was walking with this man, Jairus, synagogue ruler, concerned father. My, my, my. And yet he encountered a challenge. You know, just because pastor told us many times, the fact that you've given your life to Jesus, the fact that you're walking with the Lord, the fact that you come to church and tithe your money doesn't exempt you from trouble. All of us have to face the same issues of life. But the good news is when we face these things, we have help. Lord have mercy. Amen. God's grace is sufficient for you. So, so pastor, they're walking down the road and on the way to the man's house. And now they have to deal with the deeds of life. What are the deeds of life? Well, they are the disappointments, the disagreements, the distractions, the disruptions, the disturbances, and the delays. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you see, I had you read the text the way I did. Because verse 21 is when Jairus meets Jesus. But in verse 25, from verse 25 to 35, there's a delay because of the distraction and a disruption by the woman with the issue of blood. That's what taught me that you have to deal with the deeds of life, even when you're walking with Jesus. Let me take my time. Lord, have mercy. I, I don't know. I don't know what your situation is this morning, but perhaps you have encountered some difficulties, fighting depression, or experiencing some disconnections, like with the utilities. You might be dealing with the deeds of life. <laughs> but the Lord sent me by here this morning to tell you that your condition is not your conclusion. No, no, this is not going to be how the story ends. When the master, when the message came in verse 25, or rather verse 35, when the message came to Jesus and Jairus because of the deeds of life, it seemed that it was too late. It seemed that the deeds of life could add another can of deed to the shelf. It seemed that he was bringing in discouragement. And he was trying to destroy the man's faith. The enemy will use delays and distractions and disruptions to short circuit your faith. And so the message comes to him. The child is now dead. So why trouble the master any further? And the good news, Jesus seemed to look immediately to the man and say, son, it's no trouble at all. I stopped by here to tell you whatever your situation is, it's a problem to you, but not to God. He told me to tell you it's no trouble, no trouble at all. <laughs> oh, Jesus, you must understand who we're dealing with. God poured out the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean like you do Pepsi. It's no trouble at all. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He steps out on the sea and rides upon the storm. It's no trouble at all. Lord, have mercy. So Jesus reassures the man that the deeds of life, the delay doesn't constitute a denial. Lord have mercy. And he says, Jairus, don't despair. Just keep on believing. I know you prayed about it, but keep on believing. Keep on trusting. Don't cast away your confidence, for it has great reward. Lord Jesus, God hears, and God cares. God sees, and he's on his way to do something about it. 
That's the next important point. If you hold on to your faith, even in the midnight hour, God's going to come and turn it around. He'll turn it around. He'll turn it around. Turn it around. He'll turn it around. He can pick you up and fix you up and keep you up. He will turn it around. God is never late. He's always on time. Your condition won't be your conclusion. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Help is on the way. Well, have you ever heard someone say that things will often get worse before they get better? That's what happened in our text. Excuse me. And you see, it is very natural for the enemy to try to intervene. Just like in football when the quarterback throws a pass, often it can be intercepted. Amen? That's what the enemy was trying to do. But you need to remember that God's ways are not like our ways. And his thoughts are not like our thoughts. Amen? When things go from bad to worse, the worst may be happening for the best. See, in Romans 8, 28, it says, in all things, God is working for the good. It didn't say that all things were good. It just said, in all things, God is working for the good. Now, I don't know about you, but the only definition I know for all is all. It includes everything, and it excludes nothing. So if all things are working together for the good, then let me just propose something to you hypothetically. Perhaps Jesus purposely delayed. It wouldn't be the first time. You remember when he got the message uh, that Lazarus was sick and dying? Amen? Jesus deliberately, intentionally stayed where he was for two days. Just suppose God is using the deeds of life to not just go to the man's house and heal his daughter, but to do something greater than a healing. Just suppose. You know, Jesus is always in charge. They had already buried Lazarus. Notice the procession, the pro progression in, in events that happened in the life and ministry of Jesus. He healed Peter's mother in the bed. He prevented uh, death in the house. He stopped a funeral procession. And then he got Lazarus from the grave. He could have come at any time earlier or sooner. But God's power is made perfect in our weakness. This delay, you see, what was the request? Jairus said, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, come on to my house. Jesus, prevent my child's death by healing her. Well, now the message just got to them that it's too late to heal her. So the, the other option is to do what? Something about death. So Jesus, it seemed, failed to grant the man's request. He didn't, get to, he didn't arrive to the house soon enough to heal her. But it's still, her condition is not going to be her conclusion. Because if God doesn't allow circumstances to deteriorate, sometimes we'll have a limited perception of his power. You need to understand, brothers and sisters, that when the Lord finally arrived at his intended destination. He had an opportunity to do something better. He was going to show how he had power over even the condition and power of death. More importantly, I want you to know 
that your condition is not your conclusion today because Jesus came down through 42 generations and arrived at Calvary one day and there he was hung up for our hang-ups and when Jesus was beaten, buffeted, and bruised and gave up the ghost, they put Jesus in a borrowed tomb. But one day he kicked the backside of the tomb out and got up with all power in his hand. And I know your condition is not your conclusion because Jesus got up so that we wouldn't have to stay down. Jairus' daughter is going down into the grave after death except Jesus do something about it well Jesus shows up walks in the room now we're down to the 42nd verse of our text verse 38 says when Jesus arrived in the house I don't have time to deal with that let me skip down he went into the room took the little girl by the hand and he showed that he had such a voice of authority that he could man the girl to come back from the other world. Lord have mercy. Jesus spoke to a dead girl as if she could hear because wherever she was, he had power in that realm and region. Jesus now had an opportunity because things went from bad to worse to show that he had a power that reached beyond the room and this world into another world. Lord have mercy. I told you the worst happened for the best. Now I got to go to my seat. I don't want to stay up here too long. But the last point is this. The man witnessed Jesus take his child by the hand. And with the anointing power of the Holy Spirit flowing through his body, this connection allowed the power of God to go through and raise her up. You remember Jesus told Mary and Martha that the resurrection is not a date on the calendar for a future event, but the resurrection is a person, me. <laughs> and he could resurrect the man's daughter because he was the resurrection. <laughs> He could get her out of the grave because he had victory over the grave. The Bible says, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Oh, it's swallowed up. Jesus had the voice of authority. Jesus had the power to raise her up. I'm going to my seat, pastor, but I don't know about you in here. I don't know how you feel about it. But I want Jesus to do for me what he did for Jairus' daughter. I want Jesus to take my hand. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on and help me stand. The day is long, help me stand. The night is weary, help me stand. The way is dark, help me stand. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on and let me stand. My eyes are full of tears help me stand my heart is full of sorrow help me stand the burden is heavy help me stand precious Lord take my hand lead me on and help me stand oh Lord that's why you hear me every now and then saying father father I scratch my hand to thee no other help I know if thou withdraw thyself from me, whether shall I go? I sing because I'm happy, and I sing because I'm free. I sing because I know his eye is on the sparrow, and it watches me. My condition is not my conclusion. No, no, the story won't end like that. Because God is available to help. God will rescue you. Hallelujah. God bless you. If you, if you are here and you don't want your condition to be your conclusion, you must be born again. 
The Bible says in Romans 10 and 9, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. And whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said, anyone that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. If you come, Jesus will receive you. If you come this morning, he'll forgive your sins. He'll change your condition, rewrite your conclusion, and put your past behind you. Come now. I'm going to, the doors of the church are open. You need to be on the Lord's side. At this time, I'll turn the service over for, to Pastor Scott. Amen. Come to Jesus, just if there's one, the door to church is open. God is waiting just for you, and he will receive you just as you are. someone desires prayer and you want to come to the altar prayer changes things prayer changes situations prayer changes people just now just now Almighty and everlasting God, our Father, we come before your holy presence. First of all, in reverence to your adorable name. And then to say thank you because you've been so good to us. And then, Lord, there are those who are going through some trying conditions seem like everywhere they turn there is no relief or release in sight but we're grateful for the reminder that our condition is not our conclusion because we serve a God who has all power in his hand and he can change whatever he wants to change. And we thank you for that. We glorify your name for your transforming power. We are grateful, God, that you can do anything but fail. And you can make a way even where there is no way. So thank you, sir. We praise your holy name. And God, if there's anything we failed to ask of you, we ask that you would look beyond our faults see all of our needs and bless us even in spite of ourselves it is in the wonderful precious marvelous and adorable name of him who died for our sins jesus the christ we pray amen amen amen
have a praise. Amen. Can we praise the Lord for our preacher? Somebody has some courage now that you didn't have when you came. And you can look beyond your contemporary condition and see your futuristic conclusion that things are going to get better. And the Lord will step in right on time. Thank you, Reverend, uh, for being uh, an encouraging preacher. Amen to help us on our journey. I am certain that we want to praise the Lord for our young persons who led us in worship today. Amen. We are always extremely proud of our young people. Uh, we don't grow weary nor tired of saying how proud of them we are. And we want to encourage them to keep the good work up because they are doing great work for the cause of Jesus Christ and the efforts of his kingdom. And we are certain that payday is coming after a while. We just have to trust God for what he's going to do. Amen. Allow me, if you would, to uh, express uh, sincere gratitude to the church family.